So, I'm Johnny X, I am your moderator, and these are our panelists, and they're going to go through and they're going to introduce themselves briefly, please. We've only got an hour, and then they kick us out of here. And um, then I'm going to ask them a question, they will answer briefly, we'll take some questions from the audience, and I'll ask them another question back and forth like that, loud or rinse, repeat. So, go ahead and introduce yourselves, please. Start at that end and work our way down. Uh, my name is Candice. Uh, I work for Bishop Fox, an information security consulting firm. I kind of specialize in a lot of social engineering, aka human hacking, as well as doing a lot of more uh, enterprise security work with helping a lot of companies strengthen their controls, their policies, procedures. I've done a lot of vulnerability management work. So when these guys do find all those vulnerabilities, I a lot of times had to process that on the other end. So if you have a lot of those kind of questions too, I can always answer those. In I'm Chad Ramey. I'm apparently not important enough to have a name placard. Uh, <laughs> Despite the fact he's the only official guest of the convention here on the panel, for some reason he doesn't have a placard. Uh, LOL. Um, I'm an undergrad student at... <laughs> there we go. Oh, wait, so, his is nicer than ours. Okay, <laughs> now we're all just... Social engineering, you ask and you receive, right? And there's a reminder on his that he's on, maybe on ECT. Right now, none of the rest of us. <laughs> just, just you get the warning. So everyone else can say what they want. <laughs> uh, they'll let us. They'll edit us out in post. You'll never see us next year. <laughs> but, okay, so that's that's a lot of pressure. Then uh, I'm an undergrad at Georgia Tech studying computer science. Uh, I, I, uh, thanks um, for for both of those. They're great. Uh, I do a lot of making things from building robots to nuclear reactors and academically I sort of study artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, so that's kind of a broad scope of things that could potentially be considered hacking so I'll just try and throw in tidbits when I can. My name is Xavier Ash. I am the uh, Vice President of Drawbridge Networks, the best security startup in Atlanta. Um, that's great. And uh, been hacking since the late 80s, been to DragonCon since the early 90s, and I'm just getting around to, you know, sitting up here and talking instead of being out there and, and bullshitting. So, um, I've, been, I've got very broad knowledge that I can bring to the table, so ask away, and I'll hand it off. My name is Drew Porter. Uh, I break into your cell phones, and I used to do it for the government, but not anymore. Uh, now I run my own security company called Red Mesa, and uh, it's also the best. It, the Atlanta it, base. it is the best Atlanta-based consultancy uh, here, uh, at least in my opinion. And I guess that's what matters. Uh, so, um, yeah, I break into buildings now. Um, not your buildings, probably, but other buildings. Um, and yeah, I just cause a whole bunch of shenanigans. Hey, what's going on? Uh, my name is Chris Grayson. I have graduated from Georgia Tech a few times. Uh, I am the founder of the best Atlanta-based cybersecurity startup. <laughs> Drink. On <laughs> website. <laughs> and uh, and prior to prior to founding this business, I was in penetration testing uh, with two of the other folks here on this panel. So basically. The professional hacker of being paid to break into systems, services, buildings, not not, not buildings super well, but uh, <laughs> all those things. And uh, so now I am predominantly a software developer, but then also do contract kind of work on the side. Just to go off script for just a moment, I uh, noticed we've got one youngster here. How many other miners do we have in the room? A couple. All right, yeah, technically we're still in like family uh, friendly child safe hours, so okay. let, let's not swear too much. We'll save that for 201. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, so introductions here. Uh, where's the stuff I wrote down? All right. Panelists, question number one. As there is no universally agreed upon definition for the term hacking, and at best we seem to have a set of interrelated concepts that people argue over, 
to a page. <laughs> what does hacking mean to you? Start at the end, work our way down. Yeah, so basically yeah, nowadays we do have hacking kind of everywhere, even I brought, this is my favorite cooking book. It actually defines hacking in a cooking book. Uh, it does more go into uh, something else, I'm going to explain in a second, but um, to me, hacking is a lot of more kind of using anything, established processes in place and kind of manipulating and abusing them for what you want to do. So it can be anything in computers, it can be humans and how much they trust each other, which that's I manipulate to know in and anything else kind of in between. Um, this one, the cooking for geeks, uh, kind of more does the life hack of like, kind of more the MacGyver sort of thing of like, how do you just kind of hack things together and make more of what we prefer in the old days, more of a hack job. Kind of that more just works in the cage. So there's kind of both of those. How far have you gotten in the book yet? Uh, I've read it before. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, just, I, it's mostly about cooking. It's just like in the first like, I, chapter. I ordered a copy, and apparently it's uh, sitting in my post office box up in Nashville, so I'm looking forward to reading that when I get back. Oh, did Thumbs you get up? the first or second edition? Second edition. Second edition doesn't have the hacking in there. It talks about... <laughs> <laughs> I know, I got both of them when I saw it. Yeah, they don't refer to hacking. I think they more got afraid of the term. So they still talk about functional fixedness and about basically using stuff in your kitchen you don't expect to use in different ways. Getting around that, but. Alright, so now I'm going to have to see how much of use copy the first edition goes for. Alright, uh, this is a great transition to a shameless plug for my panel tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. called uh, Better Alcohol on Perfect States. I'll be talking about hacking food. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the steaks part. Um, but, but anyways, um, uh, last year at a uh, hacking convention in Nashville, I, I heard a old wise person talk on a panel who said that hackers are, are the most true to form champions of lost cause. Uh, and and I, I think that I typically can associate anything that's a hack as, as kind of doing things the hard way to make it right by whatever end goal you're, you're searching for. So maybe taking someone else's tool and circumventing um, their DRM to make uh, an iPhone easy to use for someone who is blind so they can have a screen reader or um, you know, taking something that is meant to not be modified that could be completely repurposed for something you need and, and doing that. Um, that to me is, is hacking. Thank you. Thank you. Next. So my earliest hack I can remember is taking one of those old, you know, CRT TVs, uh, you know, I think it was like a little 13 inch or something, and I wanted the, like the sound to be awesome from this TV because, you know, that would be great. So I just took it apart and figured out how it worked. I looked at all the wiring and I figured out where the, the, the audio went to the little tiny speaker in it, snipped off the wires, realized that, that I had a good mono, you know, just one little sound uh, coming out and uh, you know, went to Radio Shack, found the right piece that, that I could cook up, and I drilled a hole in the side, and I put a, a basically a headphone jack in the side of that, that TV. And, and then I was able to connect it to my stereo system, and of course it was just mono, but it was now loud, which was really cool. Uh, that, that in myself is, is hacking to me, is I, I look at, you know, uh, I, I want to know how things work, and the best way to do that is to take the back off. And, and that's what I do with stuff, is, is that if I really want to know how it works, I have it. Yeah, so uh, hacking for me is uh, less actually like, technical. <clears throat> hacking is a mindset, I believe, and that mindset can be applied to many different things, uh, whether that be uh, you know, cooking or electronics, such as the TV or um, hacking with something that's very mechanical, such as uh, an engine, stuff like that. But it's a mindset on how you approach a problem and how you overcome that obstacle. So yeah, that's that's how I define hacking. Yeah, I would, I would, you know, what, what Drew said resonates with me a lot as well, of uh, really the way that I see hacking is I, you're given a system, and the system has a set of rules. This might be a piece of software that does a set of uh, finite things. This might be, you know, cooking, where it's like, you know, you have, you have temperature, you have ingredients, you have these various things. So you're given a set of rules, and you want to make this system do something that it's not built to do. 
but you still have to follow those rules to make it happen. Um, and so it's kind of the mentality that you have to take when looking at the system. It's like, okay, I see how the system works. I see that here's all the different things that it's meant to do. Can I make, can I use these in some particular sequence or like mash them together to accomplish something that the system was not initially designed to, uh, to fulfill? Okay, thank you all very much. Now, given that info dump, uh, we'll take the first batch of questions from the audience. Please lighten up at the human mic stand. Raise your hand and microphone, please. Human mic stand, where is the, there we go. He's in the back for everyone that's like and Well, around. no one can see him. Yeah, back there. Hey, any questions? Who's got the hand? Any questions? Who's got the hand? First question, while we're waiting for people to go up to the human mic. Oh, you're going to them. Okay, well, no? Well, are we going to? Yeah, it's like, you know. Yeah. All right. <laughs> You can come out the row, I don't know. So, Thanks. so my first hack was probably when I was five years old. I want to know how my mother's alarm clock works. So I took a butcher knife and packed it up. So what was your first hack? That was the next that, that's question. the next question I was going to ask of them. Sorry. Stop <laughs> reading our minds. <laughs> Stop hacking us. <laughs> While we're waiting for the next audience question, we'll get to yours, we will. Um, do we have a demo? Are we doing demos on this? Do we have anything lined up that we should be setting up in the background um, while we do the first batch of audience Q&A panelists? I guess no, maybe. Uh, I have an easy demo. All right, so I guess we're not doing a demo, so we'll go to the next question. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, you asked about the definition of, your personal definition of what hacking is, and I'm wondering how that would differ from creative re-engineering or repurposing of hardware to create a new device, a new function without actually modifying the original use. That's the same. That's right in line. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's definitely that's hacking. hacking. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That was easy. <laughs> Max, come on, give us some hard ones. We don't bite much. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> What's the first thing you do to establish your foothold? Oh. Foothold uh, oh. on, on, on an endpoint? Or what, what are you going with Hardware, network people, network. network. Oh, on a network. Ooh, first so step. Prepare, so yeah. prepare, testing. Okay. Find, get my piece of paper signed by the client so I don't get arrested. <laughs> 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 I, would, I would say that the first thing that I always do is look at web applications. Uh, and that's actually another shameless plug. That's some of the software that I'm building uh, in my company to precisely do this because the vast majority of times, the majority of attack service that an enterprise has is buried in its web applications. They're poorly written, they're poorly maintained, and nine times out of ten, there's going to be poorly written functionality that enables you to establish a foothold into a network within them. What's a good first couple steps to get your feet wet with hacking of anything? There has been a great explosion of really good training material online uh, with you know, videos, step-by-step -step videos, and uh, it really um, is uh, it's, it's, it's fortunate. And so to be able to, you know, you know you've got to get realized, from us, we, we, we think about all these things that are hacking, and we divide it up into little categories, and if you're coming into it, you don't understand the difference between, you know, endpoint hacking and, and you know, endpoint security versus network security. Uh, but, you know, you get, take a mind, of what are you doing this for? So, so you know, are you, you wanting to change careers? Um, and then look at you know where the, the the jobs that you want to do is it you know red team which is you know the hack the pen testing stuff or is it the uh, blue team which is helping companies defend and and look for you know training materials specific on that so that you're 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 at least kind of got a direction because if you just kind of dive in and go to one of those training sites that uh, um, or you know YouTube channels. Uh, you can quickly get inundated by just all the different things that you can do. So try to focus in on something, and and uh, and and that will that will be a lot more productive for you. I think uh, letting like sort of your your curiosity for a particular topic guide you is one of the best things you can do. So for instance, if you're interested in in networking, learn how the internet works. So learn how the TCP IP stack is you know put together and download Wireshark and watch packets go across the network and uh, set up a Raspberry Pi as a server and you know set up a web service on that 
Um, there's a, uh, a, a package you can download that you can install in Raspberry Pi called uh, Dan Vulnerable Web uh, Application that has a whole suite of like cross-site scripting and SQL injection attacks that you can try on it with really well-written documentation on the, on the web for solutions to guide you through it. Um, if you're interested in hardware hacking, I would say um, Arduinos are a great place to start or if you're actually interested in reverse engineering firmware and, and things like that or something, I would go buy an old Xbox and a uh, bus pirate, which I've, I've got one with me today, but I can talk about it more in 201 like, when we actually do like have time for demos and stuff. This little guy is like 35 bucks and he's kind of similar to an Arduino, but he talks basically like every digital and analog language that you could ever want. Uh, you hook it up to your PC and then it's got a bunch of breakout ports that you can just solder on to your Xbox motherboard and uh, you can do things like dump all the memory off of the Xbox onto your computer and then modify and re-upload and mod an Xbox to run Linux and um, you can do that process with Roombas and Xboxes and TVs and you know, anything that has a computer in it has memory that you can dump and modify the contents and re-upload and either brick your device or make something cool happen. <laughs> so probably the first one. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Acquire cheap devices, shenanigans ensue, brick profits, fine. Uh, if I can yeah. jump in for a second, become a scavenger. Get junk, working or not. Rip it apart, figure out which pieces work, which ones don't, build working stuff out of it, build working computers, build a home network, load Linux on it, join a local Linux users group if there's not one near you, get on the mailing list for one or several, talk to people, play, don't be afraid to break stuff, don't be afraid to fail, you learn more from your failures than your successes. And figure the stuff out, just play with it and get stuff working and doing what you want it to do. That's half of it right there. Yeah. Teachers, make an effort to teach yourself something every day. Even if it's as small as like you're going to read a Wikipedia page, it's consistency and it's immersion over time that will really help bring you into this field. On, on Drew's point, uh, there is a Linux user group out of Georgia Tech here in Atlanta, and there's also a, an Atlanta 2600 chapter that does meetings at uh, Linux Mall Food Court fairly regularly, which is just a group of... Yeah, yeah, it's a bunch of people that hang out in the Linux Mall food court. I think it's on the first Friday night of every month at like 7 p.m. or something like that. And these are people from over Atlanta. Some, some, uh, a lot of the guys are from like Pin Drop Security, which is a startup based out of Tech Square. Uh, some Freesiders, which is a makerspace or slash hackerspace here in Atlanta, which is a great resource to get involved in if you're here in Atlanta. Um, so immerse yourself in some groups of people who do hacking and listen to the projects they're working on, offer help. Um, if, if you can offer help, whether it be for man manual tasks or just researching something, uh, you have a mentor who can you know, guide you on a project. And having a project is often like one of your first steps. Just decide something you want to hack, and maybe someone giving you that thing is could be a good starting point. I want to make a shout out for the Chattanooga Linux users group too, even if you're nowhere near the area, they have an amazing mailing list. There's a lot of ham radio stuff on there too. Uh, the group is called Chugalung, which I think is hilarious. And National Linux users group is pretty good too, in luck. So. And also, there are two Drews on this panel, though only one Drew named Hag, so if you get confused. Yeah, I'll just be Johnny X. <laughs> um, next question from the audience. Yeah, I was just curious, uh, which operating system or distribution, assuming Linux, you guys prefer for personal use? Well, what do you guys like? Uh, I mean, so what do I run on my desktop? I run Windows 10. I do a lot of customer-facing stuff, but I need to know how to tell people how to do stuff in Windows. Um, and uh, but. I spend most of my time in Linux. Right now, I'm using Ubuntu, is, is my platform of choice. It used to be Red Hat, and I worked for IBM for about seven years, so I ran Red Hat on the desktop. So, uh, it's really just kind of, you know, in the face of my career. If you're, you know, in Ubuntu and some of the other, you know, mainline uh, Linux distributions is, is a great place to start, because it's, you know, easier to install, and, and there's lots of resources, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm actually running Windows 7 on this. The rest of the panel. Yeah. 
I'm also running Windows 10, but that's mostly because my personal computer is also my gaming rig. And you get a lot more support for video games on Windows 10 than like Linux. So. <laughs> I like I like flavors of Debian, um, which Ubuntu also falls under. Um, but also, I mean, for, for hacking stuff, it's kind of cheesy, but getting started, uh, Kali Linux and Backtrack are pretty easy to download and point at like CTF servers that you can find online or go to a con that has CTF servers and you know plug your laptop in or use one of their burners or use a burner, that's a good idea if you're at a CTF um, and, and just use the suites of available tools like Metasploit that come with uh, Backtrack that are kind of like point and click you know, find vulnerabilities and execute vulnerabilities uh, hacking tools. So those are good to skills as well. Yeah, uh, my desktop system, I use uh, Windows 10 for gaming and CAD development. Uh, and then my personal laptop, I use Gentoo. Just kidding, I don't like that much pain. <laughs> um, uh, I use uh, Debian. I do a lot of software defined radio stuff. Uh, or Ubuntu, or whatever flavor of Ubuntu or Debian you want. Basically the same thing. Um, but yeah, so uh, I use that for my personal laptop just because I use it uh, for a lot of software defined radio development. So. What does software environment? Uh, so I, uh, I like, uh, what is it, uh, XFCE, um, but many times uh, I'll, I'll load up GNOME. Uh, just because, like when I go to a conference and I bring my laptop, I always have like a laptop hard drive uh, just for that conference. So, because I know it's going to get like totally fucked anyway. Oh, shit. It's going to get, it's, it's going to get um, you know, messed up. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, with that, um, yeah, j I mean, just downloading a bunch of straight and then just uploading it. Uh, I usually have to do some modifications because I use Lenovo's uh, for XFCE, and I don't have time to do that every single time. But with GNOME, it works right out of the box with Lenovo's. Vim or Emacs to uh, all we're at trenches. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't, I don't like getting into religious debates. Uh, <laughs> but Vim. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be the odd one out here and say OSX. Uh, it is the only, it's basically the only Linux variant which you can run all of your software you need to interact with modern businesses. And B then you BSD can also have variant. it. Huh? BSD variant. BSD variant, I'm sorry. <laughs> BSD variant that you can use. And basically all of the tools that you, not all of them, a lot of the tools that you need to run to do sort of pen testing stuff run natively in OS X instead of having to install anything on top of that. And VMware Fusion is awesome, so I've also got Kali and Ubuntu and Windows 10 and Windows 8 and Windows 7 and all just ready to go side by side. <coughs> Thank you very much. Next audience question, please. Two questions. Uh, have you ever no, been just one. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever been caught inside of a honeypot? Oh, caught inside of a honeypot? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, that, that's kind of, kind of what honey pots are for, is to, to catch us, um, if, if it's set up properly. Next audience question? No? Or do we, do we want to do our next nice question? Yeah. Uh, I remember some of you from years back, and uh, I think the first time I saw you guys was in 2013. Um, I was just wondering if there's like a highlight in those last three years that you guys Share. Uh, yeah, go ahead and answer, and then we'll, we'll officially roll into that. Well, your best hack may not be in the last three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Last three years. Well, my best hack is the thing with my slides and all that. So. Let's go ahead and answer his specific question, just with, since 2013, and then we'll, we'll go into the next panel's question. So I, I think it was two years ago we had Sarek on. It was 101 or 201. He's a cool guy. We should talk to him after this panel. Um, maybe he'll show up to 201 uh, tomorrow night. Uh, but anyways, towards the end of the panel, people were just bringing kind of phones, and were like, here, root this, please. And he would plug it up to his computer and be like, okay, it's rooted, let's have the next one. Uh, you know, just like iPhones, Androids, left and right, like, oh yeah, this is no problem. And 
It's the day it's bought in Peru by like <laughs> If you want me to root your phone, just bring no, up your phone. No, you're right. uh, <laughs> Don't do it, it's a trap. <laughs> but, but it was hilarious. It was just a, a, a fury of phones left and right going in and out of you know, USBs on his computer. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it's rooted now. Here you go. That was, that was pretty hilarious. All right, shall we do the panelist question now? Thank you. All right. Panelists, tell us about one of the following. Either your best hack, your worst hack, or your favorite hack. Um, one that's not actually your own. Uh, best, worst, or favorite of someone else. I can, I, all right, let me, let me start. This yeah, we'll go, okay, so uh, I'm gonna go with the worst hack. Well, not worst hack, just a, it was, this one was kind of funny, and this is why I said earlier that I'm not the best at physical kind of testing. Uh, so I was on an engagement with a guy, uh, and basically this was Pretty cool guy. Yeah, pretty easy, he was all right. And uh, he was on a physical pen test, and basically this, in, this entailed having to break into a uh, particular building, and this particular building was a very tall building. Uh, some might even call it a skyscraper, and I went all the way to the top of this building, thinking that, you know, this is my first time ever doing this thing, like, hey, well, there might be an entrance, uh, there might be an entrance, like, maybe I can get in through the stairwell somehow. Uh, so I entered the stairwell on the top floor of this building. Turns out that none of those doors were open. So I ended up walking down 30 plus flights of stairs in full business attire in the middle of the summer. Uh, and then get to the bottom where there's the door that I can finally potentially open and I look at it I was like, I don't know if I should do this. So I sent a picture to Drew and I'm like, can I open this door? And just one word response in capital letters, no. <laughs> so apparently there were like security controls on that door. So I had to walk up a flight of stairs, go to the second floor and then sit there sweating all of my life blood out, <laughs> just in the stairwell until Drew came and opened the door and let me out of the stairwell. <laughs> and that was one of my worst hacks ever. <laughs> so one of my best hacks involves one of my friends walking down the aisle, just getting out. <laughs> oh. No, uh, one of my best hacks. Um, yeah, so I do a lot of RF stuff, and I like breaking technologies which are related to cellular. Uh, one of the best hacks, I have so many good hacks that I wish I could tell you guys. Um, but the US government paid me lots of money. Just and when I say paid me, I mean they paid my bosses which spent it all and I got paid nothing. Eight dollars an hour actually. Uh, <laughs> um, but the best hack that I can talk about uh, was dealing with a critical infrastructure uh, provider and they had me look at their WiMAX system. So the US government had the smart grid grant for a few billion dollars and within this grant you could use one or two technologies. Um, one of the technologies a lot of these power companies were using. Um, so this power company uh, hired the company I worked for at the time to have me look at it and uh, I broke it completely. I broke it so much that that particular product was actually taken out of the grant. Um, uh, and it wasn't really given a reason why, um, like to the other companies, and then they figured it out. Uh, the company did two, two and a half years later fix everything that I found that was wrong with them, uh, but it did take two and a half years to fix everything. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, we found a problem that allowed me to uh, get in with zero authentication into their. Scanning network hooked up to WiMAX. So anything that they had running WiMAX, I could compromise, uh, get into their network, as well as have any of their units connect to my network uh, and give me everything that I need, including the certificate that I would require if I wanted to go in through the authentication method uh, or the authenticated way uh, to, uh, yeah, just completely take over everything. It was so bad that the engineers didn't know uh, who to call for that company. So we called general support, and the engineer literally said, uh, I need to talk to your guys' CTO, and the like help, le help desk lady was just like, uh, excuse me, who is this? And it's just like, oh, my name's so-and-so, I'm with this company. Uh, I just found a guy that broke every pair of years, and you guys are literally gonna lose millions of dollars. Um, and we, we got the CTO on the line, like, actually. <laughs> Quick. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, that that was a fun outbrief. 
um, mm -hmm. because I had to tell a company like, oh, you spent all these millions of dollars that sure you got from the government for free, uh, but you can't use this product and no one else can use this product ever again. And for anyone who's not familiar with uh, SCADA, uh, when he says SCADA, those are industrial control systems. So if you have access to a SCADA network, you have access to some serious stuff. So I'm going to uh, talk about my favorite hack for somebody else uh, uh, that I'm, I'm loving playing with right now. So um, what I have here is a regular, you know, looks like a regular USB drive. One of the things that you know movies love to do is where you know the, the super elite guy goes in and sticks in a USB key and does all this magical stuff and it hacks the whole network. This one does. It's called it's called the rubber ducky. Uh, it's made by a company called Hack Five H A K Five. And basically, I can take it apart. It's got this little memory card on here, and I can put a payload. Basically, there's a scripting language in which I can write all the stuff that I wanted to do on an endpoint, and, it, and then you walk up to a computer, you stick it in, and it does it. Several different, you know, lots of different operating system support, you know, both for Windows, Mac, and Linux. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just one of those you know, like, kind of like sci-fi <coughs> things that, you know, it's just really fun. But usually to, to do this stuff, you gotta go and, you know, either social engineer, do some spear phishing, or do some malware work to get access to an endpoint uh, and physical security is just uh, it's more easy for me to, to think about you know accessing a, a secretary's machine to be able to just stick this thing in and and do what i want and, and be able to pull this off and walk away it'll it'll do its thing it'll upload my you know the results it'll email it to me um, and, uh, and we'll definitely play with the more uh, if we have to design with the uh, hacking tool one. But this is uh, yeah, this is my favorite little toy right now. Is, is, uh, is the rubber ducky. Uh, for the sake of hilarity, uh, I'll talk about my worst hack. And I would say that we we had someone last year, or maybe it was at another conference, not least remembering terribly, ask if life hacks are considered hacks. And I, I think we were, we were pretty much like, yeah, that's 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 a hack. Um, if you want to hear about my best hack, I'll be talking about it tomorrow in my smart uh, wearables panel. And I'm really excited to talk about that. But worst hack was definitely a life hack, and uh, it happened at DragonCon. Probably at, like my most embarrassing moment I, I've ever had in my life. It was just really stupid, and Johnny X was in, oh, around for this to happen. Uh, so we um, were doing Evil Geniuses for a Better Tomorrow. I think it was three or four years ago, and. Um, at that particular Evil Geniuses for Better Tomorrow, we were going to demo uh, my nuclear reactor, and we had also brought liquid nitrogen to make margaritas with. So it's going to be a really fun panel, um, to say the least. And um, but we, we had to bring all of the nuclear reactor and an, an entire nuclear reactor and like a, a huge doer of liquid nitrogen from the Hilton to the Sheraton. Um, down the sidewalk, through the crowds of people. We had like stormtrooper escorts that year, so it was like well, that was one of the coolest things that I ever done. But my scantily clad women carrying signs that said, "Get out of the way! This is a real nuclear reactor built by a 16-year-old out of eBay junk." So good time. Everything is going super well. We get to the Sheraton, and we're just staying there. I'm about to be on a panel where I'm like drenched in sweat, and I'm like, I would like to cool down. I have a bunch of liquid nitrogen sitting <laughs> What could go wrong? Um, so I had a water bottle. So this is a story in safety with cryogenic fluids. <laughs> All the young ones in the audience can learn from this. Do not do this. Um, so I had a bottle of water and I poured pretty much all of the water out. I wanted a little bit of water so I could generate some, some steam. Um, so I took the top off and like a sensible human being, I, I um, used a knife to stab some holes in it for pressure relief, and then um, put some liquid nitrogen into the bottle, loosely screwed the cap onto the bottle, and then set it onto a table behind me, and then put my shirt over the bottle. <laughs> and I had like a couple of seconds of really, really great cooling. <laughs> uh, and I was uh, it, on cloud nine, it was great. Uh, and then someone like called my name from across the room and I was like, oh, hey, how's it going? And took a step forward. And what happened in, in the, the, the seconds that followed was, was the water bottle tumbled off of the table to land perfectly on its lid. 
Uh, when doing so, gravity took effect and the water that was once in the bottom of the bottle went to the top, and the liquid nitrogen settled on top of that and froze a layer of ice onto those pressure relief vents that I had poked in the bottle, therefore creating, like, an explosive. Uh, <laughs> I guess exactly an explosive. Um, so it's like very similar to like a dry ice bomb that you see people make. And uh, the Dasani water bottle expanded probably three times its size and then blew up in the Sheraton lobby. It was loud. It was, it was loud. The panel before us in the, the ballroom was running late and I had gone in to see what the problem was. And it, well, I can say this now, I'm not a staff anymore. It was the fucking ghost hunters. And I have for years, for 10 years now, I have been forbidden to go anywhere near the ghost hunters because of incident. And um, most of the science track staff as well as the skeptics track staff and a few of the other reality uh, track staff and directors, and we, we're not allowed to go near the ghost hunters because well, debunk. Anyway, so, boom! From halfway across the hotel, and I come running out, and security people are converging on me. <laughs> What's going on? What's going on? <laughs> and uh, I was, people were freaking out because the three or four people that were standing there with us were just like hands over ears because it was so loud. And we have this equipment with a sign next to it that says, yes, it's a real nuclear reactor. <laughs> I was just trying to figure out my story, and I don't even remember what I said to the security guards, but it must have been really smooth, because they were like, don't do that again. <laughs> so perhaps that was my best hack. Uh, I remember we offered, them, we offered them liquid nitrogen margaritas. Yes, yes, okay, maybe that's what it was. Um, and, uh, yeah, four, three or four years ago, and I'm still somehow at Dragon Con. Uh, but that worst, worst hack of all time. Yeah, do not put cryogenic fluids in sealed containers in public spaces. <laughs> Next to nuclear reactors. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> oh, all right, um... No pressure to you know, following that story up. <laughs> She bought slides. I, I was gonna say, I'm, I'm the one that over-prepared and have slides. I don't know if I can see them, but no. Everything, but showing up on the thing, because I can't know. Uh, wait, no. Then we're just gonna do this without. <laughs> Did you try to reboot? Oh. There you go. Oh, oh right in there. Do we try turning it on and off again? Yay! Yay! Come on, let's try that. Would anyone, while we're waiting for this, willing to give me their uh, phone password and show me that it actually works for a lockpick set? No? Okay. It's a I nice tried. set. I tried. I tried. Yeah. I'll yeah. <laughs> give you a lockpick set in exchange for your phone password. Is that what you actually your phone password? We got some of them. Go ahead. All right. Sweet. Okay. So just basically, it's still just going to be just mostly just the one slide, but um, just kind of helps tell the story. So this was basically a physical pen test I did a few years ago. Uh, what we more or less did was we started out with doing a lot of research and reconnaissance, trying to figure out like, all right, how do we get into this power company, is what it was. And so we found actually like what their polos look like, what their badges look like, what places around the building were good places to break into, what had to be security. So we found their uh, loading deck up on the side of the building, and we decided to go from there. I got their badges um, and kind of photoshopped my own thing. Put them, and the thing is too, is what you can easily do with any of the badges, you can just get like a fake one, Photoshop, print out a piece of paper, and then when you put it like in a plastic sleeve, no one can tell the difference. Because even then, if they're going to look at it closely, you've kind of already lost the battle if they're questioning you. So I even, I remember too, I even put the name on there, as Kara 3s, which is from Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, you're going to come check who I am, you're just, just going to get nothing. But, um, so we just did that, I had, we called up their local, like, uh, a place that made polos nearby. We pretended to be their marketing team, needed some extra polos for the company. So then I could just wear official like that. Uh, then we went around, uh, got tailgated in, went behind like two women to get through the first set of doors. There was a second set, but a guy was coming out right as I was kind of going up there and just like a perfect gentleman, he held the door open for me and put me right in. 
So then I need no badge, got my coworker then in with me too. So we just then started running around the building. There was like six floors and then in the basement was their data center. So we just went and explored around, try to look at all of their like networking diagrams, see if anyone left their computers open, found anything around and we just kind of just blended right in. Even my coworker loved laughing at me because I found a table, uh, table that had like free food on it. So I was walking around with watermelon just as I'm breaking the I'm like, eh, okay. So while we did that, we also planted a pwn plug underneath someone's cube, which if no one knows, pwn plug kind of is a, it's a pen testing sort of tool. It's also technically a security tool. But you can put it into any network. It has a lot of security tools built into it. People can remotely then get into it. It can also bypass a lot of firewall uh, configurations. So I just plugged that in and had some of my coworkers who remotely just start basically doing an internal pen test for them. So, and then we went downstairs, uh, got to their, got around to their data center. Uh, there was, which, this was the, kind of the doors to the, to the data centers. Um, sorry also for the kind of potato call. Yeah. <laughs> no, just kind of like one thing, it was just more kind of a diagram that shows like, this is the steps I took. This is only one photo. I don't think you have a duplicate. I think you have a span. How many hackers does it take to get the projector to work? <laughs> I've had humans, not computers. Exactly. It was OSX to be on that screen right now. If it was OSX, password would show up probably too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lenovo was there. Finally, okay. Can you flip back a couple? Yeah, there's only one other slide, so this is what I was showing the whole time, or I thought I was showing. But yeah, so this is just kind of the steps that we took, was just kind of doing the reconnaissance, getting the things together, tailgating in, going around the building, home plug. So. Right. Yeah, no. so this was their data center doors. Uh, as you can see, there was even no tailgating right in, which we just thought was hilarious, because then someone just came out and let us right in as we were standing there on the phone <laughs> trying to get them to come out. So they just, we just got right past them. Uh, I even loved it. We had a few photos too of like a cop on a Segway going right past us, not even like noticing us at all. And don't have that in the slides. We couldn't find it anywhere. But yeah, so then we just got that. Uh, sorry for the potato quality. This was with one of those hidden camera pens we had on, and so it's not the best picture. <laughs> Yeah, so it's just, it's really easy to get into a lot of places, just especially when, like, I kind of use what works for me as a sign. I am a female. I feel a lot of people that I also am not overly pretty, not anything else. I am very non-threatening to, like, almost the extreme. So people just let me in just about anywhere, and trust me, we'll just let me in. <laughs> so much fun. So I just real quick adding on to Candace's story. So I, I was actually on an engagement with Candace uh, once where she was planting a pump plug uh, in the Target's office. And I remember during the outbrief, uh, so she had planted it and it had a, she put a sticky note on it that said, do not remove. And then, <laughs> yeah, do not touch. And put the name of our point of contact at the bottom. So it was like a note from the, the technical guy. And apparently the technical guy was freaking out. He was like, why? Why, why wouldn't you tell me about this? It's like, I had a note on it. It said, don't move it. It was from you. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just easily put it on. I think it's written on it in Sharpie 2 before. It still works. Still yeah. people will still validate it. One thing Candace forgot to mention in her story is the place where they called for the polos. They were like, yeah, hey, we need to get polos for this company. We're part of their marketing department. And they literally told her, Oh, do you guys want us to just use the same logo we have on file? <laughs> and they use that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and bill it to the advertisement part. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, let's do the next round of audience questions. I think we've got about 20 minutes left. So, no, 16 minutes. So, next question, please. What are some things I should do to prevent, uh, like, a malicious hack to my phone, uh, computer, home network, something like that, or just doing some easy things or some... Just, just give up and, and throw away don't everything. Don't give it to Drew. What? Yeah, don't give me a password to Drew. You just change your lockpicks. He'll secure it for you. Um, 
There's no simple answer to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah it is a hard one. Yeah, you'll have to come to 201 and we can that. show you yeah, stuff. Yeah. The, the, come to 201, give us your laptop, we'll help you. <laughs> you can trust us, we're your friends, we're here to help. Three simple answers is this. Uh, if you have wireless uh, on your home network, which I assume you do, uh, use WPA2 um, and uh, use a very long password with that. Uh, then for your phone, uh, make sure that you have two things on there. One, you have a password, uh, like a lock screen password that's longer than four digits. A, a PIN. Yes. An actual PIN, not one of those other little code things. Yeah, no, no squiggly things, no four digit PIN is longer than that. Um, and then uh, with your phone, you should also have, when it boots, uh, encryption, uh, full disencryption that I asked for a password uh, in the beginning as well. Uh, and then for like your laptop and stuff like that, um, again, full disencryption. If you're not getting my point, it's encrypt everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, no, so strong Wi-Fi password, WPA2 only, um, full disencryption on your phone, and then a strong uh, like lock screen password, and then full disencryption on your laptop. And stick to well-known adult websites. <laughs> <laughs> Probably safe. If you're not sure how to do a lot of this stuff, you can frequently find uh, tutorials on YouTube that'll walk you through <coughs> how to do it. That's a good place to start. Google is your friend. Um, again, get on technical mailing list, uh, Linux user groups list, good places to start. And a uh, good rule of thumb is don't be the low hanging fruit. Make sure that you're surrounded by people who are easier to hack than you are. So, <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, just like with zombies where you just have to be faster than the person next to you, just there be you more go. secure than them, and you're probably fine. And, and for uh, passwords, uh, one thing that goes along, well, use a password manager first off, but for passwords that you don't throw in your password manager, pick a sentence that you can remember. Yeah, easier passwords. to remember and make it super light. So, so. Basically, I have sentences as passwords on all of my most sensitive uh, assets. So we're talking like 40 characters long. Uh, but easy to remember, fairly easy to type. Well, if, if, you, if you want. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you want like, for instance, you could have a password like, I'm totally not going to tell you the password to this Wi Fi number. And if, if you want a good explanation of why to do that, how many are you? Uh, of you are familiar with the webcom of XKCD. Woo! So, yeah, you can Google XKCD and password entropy, and there's a fantastic script that explains in agonizing detail why this is better than picking an eight character random password with upper or lowercase numbers, but well, it's a hell of a lot easier to remember a simple sentence that has meaning to uh, you and nobody else. There's a website called uh, Am I Owned? I think it's that. Have I been pwned? Have, have, have I been pwned? Yeah. Have I been pwned? Yeah. And you know, basically, you, you just put in your, you know, uh, I think it's an email address, and and, uh, or, or, and and it tells you of all the big hacks that's recently happened. They have a huge database. That, you know, has your uh, password been, you know, um, that gives you an idea of being able to say, uh, you know, if I use that password on Dropbox, is a recent one. You know, there's there's another big one today. Is that you need to not use that password ever again. Because what hackers do is they take those databases of, of passwords and they add it to their you know, brute force file. So when they go, they're gonna try actual passwords that people have. And so if you reuse uh, uh, passwords, uh, you can easily get hurt. And the other note I wanted to make is that iOS encrypts by default. Uh, Android does not. And so, uh, if, but it is an option, you go into settings and you can then click the button that says, you know, encrypt this phone and, and, and get that done. I have no idea about Windows phone. Just throw it away. <laughs> <laughs> Who has a, like, this is a serious question, not like we're gonna poke fun at you or anything. Um, it's not. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna poke fun at you. Who has a Windows phone, for real? Or like something that's not Android or iOS? My boss does. <laughs> hey, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Any, any Blackberries the, out there? Who's there still supporting the Blackberry? The Space Track Director. There's the Blackberry. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Cool. That's pretty, that's pretty neat. And don't use your thumbprint scanner. Oh, God, no. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a talk after this talk that discusses why you shouldn't use thumbprint. Yeah? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, the talk after this talk that talks why you should not use thumbprints for thank you passwords. We're gonna take the next question in just a moment. Um, my friend Dustin here is going to walk around with this giant jug here. We're gonna start collecting for Hacking 201 Pizza. If you're not gonna be a 201, of course, you're under no obligation to contribute. You're under no obligation anyway. Um, he does. And when we're done with this panel, to make sure yeah, everyone is honest and transparent and everything, we'll meet outside um, about 10 minutes after this panel ends and we'll do a public count of the money and make sure everyone's got the total and you can record the count if you want. We've been doing this for about 20 years and we've never had a, an issue with the money yet. So, Dustin, go do your thing and we'll take the next audience question, please. Any, yeah, any thoughts, conspiracy theories, or inside information on uh, Lucky Green? On what? Say again? Lucky Green, the tour node, one of the founding tour nodes that recently he removed, stopped uh, being a part of tour. Yeah, was that part of the uh, removal? It wasn't just that one, right? It was like a few high profile ones by one of the developers. One of the yeah, people, one, yeah, one of the first developers. Yeah, of Tor. Yeah, so he took down uh, a few of his exit nodes or, or entry nodes. He took a few, few of his nodes down. Um, yeah, no, no real comment on that. I just want to make sure that's what we were talking about so everyone knew. So, uh, yeah, I also, also don't really have any specific comments on this, but I would like to point out that Tor is a uh, program that was built by the Department of Defense. Talking about conspiracies now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, oh, that's so weird that they paid for it. Might be, might be. Yeah, sorry, right. sorry, no, no comment here. Yeah. Next question, please. Um, so I recently implemented uh, Eat TLS as a form of authentication for my wireless, and I was just wondering what is, like, instead of WPA2, what is the inconsistencies that you've seen with Eat TLS and, and certificate-based authentication? If not, what are your favorite attack vectors to get into a, 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 a network like that? Also, <laughs> for Canvas, um, so I do social engineering as well, and I usually play the, what's going on? Card. Yeah, it's a damn like you stress is what I like to call it. <laughs> right. Um, what are your, I guess, easiest um, ways into a, a company or something like that? Okay. Um, you want to handle the network question first? Yeah. So um, since you are like the first real wireless question, okay. you get a lock pick because I love wireless. Uh, Woohoo! So I'm gonna get that. Um, did someone else ask the wireless questions first? No, that's, okay, so EAP, uh, uh, Enterprise Access Point is what EAP stands for, and a lot of companies use it, and they implement it incorrectly. Two things that they do incorrectly. Uh, first thing, they allow their users to accept certificates. Never allow your users to accept certificates. Users do what users do, which is like work in spreadsheets. Um, they're not security professionals. We don't expect them to be. The second thing is, um, even if they don't allow users to accept certificates, um, uh, accepting all types of certificates. Uh, this deals more with users accepting certificates, meaning that when they jump onto a wireless access point, that's a rogue access point, uh, which the tool that you'd be using for this is called uh, Host APD, uh, but it's the Wireless Ponage Edition, WPE. Uh, mod for it. It's a simple tool. You can download it on Linux uh, and then run it, uh, and then you can start up rogue access points. With that, you uh, then send out a fake certificate uh, and a fake challenge and response, and you get their challenge and response back. Uh, so they have to say, like, hey, you're trying to connect with this network, and they click, it says, like, oh, this certificate might not be trusted, but it's just a random box that pops up and it has the word OK on it. And that's code for users to click that button, okay? So uh, with that, they'll just click OK, and then they'll enter in their username and password. You do not get their username and password. You get their challenge and response. Uh, that, uh, then what you do uh, is you run a, uh, uh, another script on it, I'm forgetting the name, unfortunately, that gives you a hash value. The hash value that it gives you, you put the crowd cracker, it costs $120 to crack. It's a 100% success rate. This table is fully saturated, meaning that the person has the ant moxie, as the person that runs that, um, as well as a few other people. 
They have the answers for every possible hash, and it will give you the answer back, which then will allow you to log on to their network. Wow. <laughs> um, so yeah, a lot of companies do that incorrectly, uh, and it's the best thing. Like whenever I'm on a client, and they're like, hey, uh, we have a wireless friend test that we want you to do. I'm like, cool, and they're running ETH, and I'm just like, awesome. Yeah, like, this is the easiest week of my life. Um, because it literally is just fully automated for me right now. Um, but yeah, but you can protect yourself by that, by limiting the certificates that you allow accepted, and limiting users' capability to accept those certificates. Um, yeah. And then Candace had it. See if anyone had anything to add, but okay. All right, so then remind me, your question was about like, what's my best? So basically, yeah, I do social engineering all day. Um, other than playing them and or going in on a service card, like we were talking about with the uh, pose and stuff like that, what, what other types of um, entrance ways have given you success in social Yeah, so usually what I kind of go with is it's kind of what's going to be the most easily trusted. So being an actual employee will give you more trust than even coming in, I think, as like more of a contractor. Like if you come in with a hard hat, I mean, yeah, a lot of people aren't going to mess with you, but some people still are. They're still going to question like, oh, okay, well, what are you here to fix? Right. Then you have to kind of try to make that up. But if you're just an employee, then hey, you're just here. You're, you're, you're just part of the background. Got to jump in five minute warning. So we'll be able to take one, maybe two more questions if we do it quickly. Just want to let y'all know where we were. So this is really more of an opinion than anything that I've done with people. Are script kitties hackers? No. <laughs> no. Ah, so uh, I'm going to. Uh, answer this in a particular way. Are script kitties, kitties hackers? Yeah, are script kitties hackers? Uh, and the answer is, well, they could be. Um, and they could not be. It just depends on their particular approach. Now, uh, script kitty is someone that's defined as someone that doesn't know exactly what they're doing and they just use automated tools um, to do like their hacking, right? There are professional pen testers uh, that are script kitties. Um, and uh, and so you definitely get paid to be a script kitty. Uh, now with that, uh, a script kitty, they might just be starting in the world of hacking and um, they're using automated tools and they don't really understand what's happening. But as long as they're moving towards uh, understanding what they're doing, um, then they will leave that stage of script kittiness and become a regular hacker. So yes, they can definitely be, it's just their approach. Are they continually learning every single day, like Chris said in the very beginning. All right, uh, time for one last question, if it's quick. Uh, this one was for Candace. Uh, so so uh, social engineering and human hacking, uh, I mean, I haven't really heard a lot about that. Uh, the only thing I can think of is uh, Michael Weston and, and Burn Notice, <laughs> you know, and all, all the stuff that he would do to, you know, get in. Uh, where, where do you, what are you going to learn more about that and, like, you know, how that's done professionally, you know, you know job outlook, things like that? So there is a great site of uh, social-engineer.org. They have a lot of the resources there. Even uh, Chris Hadgeny uh, has written quite a few books about it too. Uh, a lot about like a lot of the psychological principles behind it. A lot of that. Um, so that's a lot of more of the professional track. Uh, social-engineer.org. Social yeah, we can even shout out for yeah, time. But yeah, there's a lot of those kind of resources. Uh, there's, I mean, they even have, they make a podcast, I think that's like every month or so, I forget, I don't know uh, But they also have like a lot of stuff like that. There's a lot of other things. You can even just do anything about even just profiling people. There's other books, like there's one like Blink, and it's about like reading people really fast. And there's, uh, even Paul Ekman does a lot of stuff about reading body language and micro expressions in the face, which then also then still just helps with a lot of other so, yeah, we can sync up and give you a lot of those resources, but I mean, social engineering, we've all done social engineering at one point in our life. We've manipulated other people, even when we were a kid, lying to our parents, like, no, I didn't eat the last cookie. Of course I did my homework. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's really easy to get into. I mean, you can even just watch people here at DragonCon, see what they're doing, guess what they're, watch their body language, figure out what they're doing, or even, even I've done it too, where I've put on like a Spanish channel, because then I don't understand the language. So then it forces me to really watch what they're doing and try to figure out, all right, what's the plot here? What's going on? And so a lot of stuff like that is, it's 
Yeah. A lot of, you know, where people, you know, interact with you is that, you know, the instant of where can I put you in a box? What type of person are you? And, and so that, that, that's that initial, do you walk up with confidence? And you're, you know, you know what you're doing, and you're just, you know, hey, how's it going? Good morning, you know, and uh, or are you, you know, going to, to approach it differently? And so, uh, as we talk about, you know, being you know, service people, uniforms are powerful. You know, if you are wearing a uniform, people you know, will assume, and, you know, and, and that's uh, and that's a huge. Problem. All right, um, that's it. I want to thank you all very much. We will be back in this room in 26 hours for Hacking 201. Your feedback is important to us. Um, you can email EFF Track Director Scott Jones and let us know what we did right, what we did wrong, how we can improve for next year. Thank you for your time and attention, everyone. Enjoy the rest of DragonCon. Be safe.